Those who are able, please stand for the reading of our gospel lesson. We're reading from John chapter 1, verses 29 through 42. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one about whom I said, He who comes after me is really greater than me because he existed before me. Even I didn't recognize him, but I came baptizing with water so that he might be made known to Israel. John testified, I saw the Spirit coming down from heaven like a dove, and it rested on him. Even I didn't recognize him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, the one on whom you see the Spirit coming down and resting is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that this one is God's Son. The next day, John was standing again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus walking along, he said, look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he asked, What are you looking for? They said, Rabbi, which is translated teacher, where are you staying? He replied, Come and see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two disciples who heard what John said and followed Jesus was Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. He led him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Amen. Please be seated. So this passage from the Gospel of John tells us from John's perspective about the first disciples that Jesus acquired, uh, for lack of a better way to say it, and at least the way John tells it. Uh, This passage, like most from John, gives a somewhat different view of the events of Jesus' life, specifically how uh, his first disciples came to follow him. In this instance, Jesus has just been baptized by John. But instead of focusing on that event itself, John doesn't relay the actual event of the baptism. Instead, he has John tell us about it after the fact. So instead of telling us about the actual baptism of Jesus, or focusing on the temptation of Jesus that's relayed immediately after his baptism in the other gospel accounts, John tells the story of the transition of authority from John the Baptist to Jesus the Christ. Right? That's the story we have here. It's the story of a transition of power. A story of a transition from John the Baptist to Jesus the Christ. This transition had to happen because John was simply the one pointing to the Messiah. That's what John keeps saying over and over again in this passage. Hey, I've come to point to the Messiah. I've come to call you to repentance so you'll be ready when the Messiah gets here. So you'll be ready when the Savior gets here. But he keeps trying to tell people, I'm not the Messiah. He's trying to convince them, I'm not the one you need to ultimately follow. It's great that you're here, it's great that you're repenting, but you're not supposed to follow me forever. And so, all of the people who had gathered around him, all of his disciples, needed to be pointed toward the one that he heralded. The one he was desperately trying to tell them about and prepare them for. And in the passage before this, just like in the other Gospels, we hear John trying to tell the crowds this message. He's trying to tell them that Jesus is coming, the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And in this passage, we hear that he's finally figured out who it is, that he baptized Jesus and the Holy Spirit came down, and he knew from God that the one that the Holy Spirit came down upon was the one that God had called to be the Messiah. But apparently, uh, with these, this first warning to the crowds, they didn't take the hint. They didn't hear. They didn't see. They weren't ready. They wanted to remain John's disciples. They wanted to stay there with John. So the next day when John sees Jesus walking toward him and proclaims to all who are around him that Jesus is the Messiah, that the heavens were opened after his baptism and that God's Holy Spirit rested on him like a dove uh, and that he is God's son, we would expect that some people would finally go, oh, that's the guy and follow him, but apparently not. They still didn't follow Jesus at that point in time. They still weren't ready. They still weren't ready to follow Jesus at that point in time, despite John's testimony, despite God's, or John's witness. But these claims that John makes in this moment to them, they're major claims. 
They're major claims about who Jesus was. They take the typical Messiah, Savior definitions where Jesus was supposed to be a political leader, where the Christ was supposed to come and fight Rome and throw off the shackles of oppression from an outside force on Israel and reestablish the greatness that was Israel. They take this typical kind of view of Messiah and Savior and add so much more to the meaning, assigning divinity to the Christ who walked among them. John takes this king that was supposed to be the Christ, this king that was supposed to come and liberate God's people from worldly oppression and adds divinity to it. He says, this is not only this king, this is God's own son. God's own son walking among us that I baptized, John says, just like all of you, that God came down and was willing to submit God's self to everything that we would go through. This was a game-changing claim. It gave a seemingly once-in-history opportunity to hang out with God, right? John is saying, this is, this is not just once-in-a-lifetime, this is a once-in-history opportunity to get to walk with the Son of God. So the next day when John sees Jesus walking along and exclaims, Look, the Lamb of God! The two disciples of John that are standing there finally get it. They finally hear what John says. That's what the passage says. The two disciples heard him. They heard him. Finally, they heard him. They heard John saying, This is the Lamb of God. This is the Son of God. That's the one right there going by. And they follow Jesus. The best part of this story to me, though, is that Jesus doesn't know that they're there at first. Right? We've got these two disciples of John the Baptist who finally hear what John says, who finally hear that this is the Son of God, that this is the Lamb of God, that this is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. We've got these two disciples of John that finally start following Jesus, and Jesus doesn't know they're there. Jesus is walking along. Jesus is going where he's going. These two start following him, and it takes him a minute. It takes him a minute to finally see them. He didn't ask them to follow him. He didn't hear John and issue an invitation. They just start following. And then Jesus realizes it and turns around and asks them, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? And they answer his question with a question. Where are you staying, Jesus? Where are you right now? Where are you going? Where are you going to stay? And Jesus' answer is simply, come and see. It's not, I'm staying over there, come stop by when you want to. It's not, I'm hanging out with this person that's a good friend of mine, and you might can come by a little later on down the line. We'll be ready for you then. It's not, oh, we're over there, but really they only take guests on Sundays, so please don't come by any other time. It's come and see. Come and see, Jesus says. And they do. They go with Jesus. They continue to follow him where he is going. And they remain with him that day. And one of them, Andrew, even goes to find his brother Simon, renamed by Jesus Peter, to get him to follow Jesus as well. And that's John's version of how the first disciples were called. Called is kind of a... Interesting term, because Jesus doesn't actually call them. They start following, and Jesus notices. That's how John says the first disciples were acquired by Jesus. Almost accidentally, it would seem. There's no fishing for people in this passage. There's no leave your nets. It's just come and see. Come and see. We underestimate this reality of how people are called to be disciples sometimes, this come and see approach. We're attracted to the eloquent wordplay of fishing for people. We're riveted by it. Come and fish for people. And we're captivated by the bold action of the fishermen who throw down their nets and leave their father in the boat and follow Jesus at his simple instruction. We like those stories. And so then what happens, though, is that we think that if we can't inspire people to just stop what they're doing immediately and follow Jesus, 
Or that if we don't have a great pitch like fish for people, for why people should come and worship with us or come to an event or just even talk about their faith with us, that we shouldn't even try. Right? We think if we don't have that ability to inspire them to just stop what they're doing and follow Jesus or we don't have that great pitch like come and fish for Jesus that we shouldn't even try. We don't have the words that we're not good enough, that we aren't ready to be a part of inviting people to know about Christ, to know about what uh, is happening among God's people. But this call story in John offers a different alternative. But to understand it, we have to examine some of the movement that's happening in the passage. I hope you've felt a little bit of it so far. You see, the people that were coming to be John's disciples were coming out to the place where he was in the wilderness. He was apparently easy to find because he had a spot where everybody knew he could be found. And in our passage this morning, every time the gospel writer talks about John the Baptist, he is standing still while Jesus is moving. Every time the gospel writer talks about John the Baptist, he is stationary and Jesus is on the go. Right? John was easier to follow as a disciple because he wasn't going anywhere. He was going to be by the Jordan where he could baptize people and tell them to get ready for when the Messiah comes. He was going to be there. That was his spot. That was where he was located. That was his address. Compare that to Jesus, though, who is always on the move in this passage. The first time John sees him, Jesus is walking towards him. The next time, Jesus is walking along, going somewhere else. Jesus is always on the move in this, this passage. And apparently, the first time, two times, John tries to witness to Jesus being the Messiah. He's already moved on by the time John can get the words out. He's not only going somewhere, he's going somewhere with a purpose. He's not lingering any place too long. And it's only on the third time that John finally gets the message across to two disciples. Two among the many who have come out to see this prophet in the wilderness crying out for repentance. Two among the many finally get the message as Jesus goes by that third time. A lot of times we want a faith life that lets us stay put where we are. That's what we want too, just like John's disciples. We want a faith that lets us stay put where we are and allows us to expect people just to know where we are and come and find us. Whether it's a pastor, whether it's our friends, whether it's our family members, that we'll have this faith that keeps us right here and people will come and find us when we need them or when they need us, one of the two. That's what we want. This is, in fact, an easy place for us to settle as disciples and as a church. And as a church. To be complacent in where we are and what we're doing in our study of Scripture, in our prayer life, in our worship attendance in our giving, in our involvement in the life of the church, in caring for and loving one another as Christ calls us to. We settle into our complacency, and then we just expect people to know that we are here at St. John's worshiping, and that when they're ready, they'll come and find us. The thing is, is that just like in our passage, Jesus is not staying put anywhere. Jesus is not staying put anywhere. Jesus is on the move still. Jesus is going somewhere, always. And he's not just going to go, but he's going in a way that is with purpose. With purpose. And we're called to follow we are called to go where Jesus is going. And not just to go, but to go in a way that is noticeable. 
We don't want to be... Uh, we want to be the disciples who get noticed. We don't want to be disciples who follow Jesus in a way that nobody knows. That maybe Jesus doesn't even know that we're following him. That is an alternative to this story. That there might have been folks who hopped on and started following Jesus, but Jesus just couldn't tell. Nothing had really changed. They were going too slow. They were kind of lingering, hoping they could just hang out with John for a little while longer in that place by the Jordan. Whatever the case may be, we want to be noticed in our following of Christ, to be a part of his movement toward the kingdom, to follow him to hospitals and nursing homes, to homeless shelters, to free medical clinics, to schools, to after-school programs, to food pantries, to medical missions, to short-term missions, to clothing closets, to everywhere that Jesus is going. To follow Jesus wherever he goes, singing his praises, lifting prayers in his name, proclaiming his gospel, and telling anyone who asks where we're going to come and see. To come and see. Because you want to know the truth about it is when we follow Jesus, sometimes we don't know where we're going. <laughs> sometimes the only option is to tell people to come and see because we're still not sure. We know and we have faith and hope that we are following Jesus because we're trying our best to be faithful, to be steeped in the word, to be steeped in prayer, to be steeped in the things of God and the practices that we know put us in touch with the divine. And so we follow, but sometimes we don't know where that leads. So our only option most of the time in our life of discipleship, our only option for inviting people to come and learn about this life of faith that we have, our only option for inviting people to come and find out what Jesus is doing is to invite them to come and see. Come and see with us. Come and find out the surprise ending to this story. Come and find out where Christ is going and what Christ is doing with me and with us as a church. Come and see. It's really pretty simple. If we're truly following the Christ who is always going somewhere, who is calling us from this place at this time to go into the world, into our communities, into our neighborhoods, and do something for the gospel, for the mission of Christ, to seek out the least, the last, and the lost, to seek out those who haven't heard the story yet, to seek out those who need to know about the grace and love and salvation of Jesus Christ. If we are following the Christ who is always going somewhere, the only invitation that we need to make is for others to come and see with us. Because we were invited to come and see at some point in time. At some point in time, somebody in the name of Jesus Christ invited us to come and see what God was doing. It might have been after you were already a part of the church. It might have been before you ever even heard about the church. It doesn't matter. At some point in your life, in your faith story, somebody invited you to come and see what was happening with them, with their church, with their life of faith, with their small group, with their Bible study, with whatever it was, they invited you to come and see and find out. And we want to be about that still. We know, we know because of who Jesus is that Jesus is going. That Jesus is going with or without us. That Jesus is already on the way. The question for us this day is will we follow Will we follow where Jesus is going? Will we follow in a way that is noticeable? And will we invite somebody else to come and see where that is? Would you pray with me this day? Heavenly Almighty God, we want to follow you. We want to follow your son Jesus Christ to all the places that he is going to all the places that he tells us he's always going, to be with those who haven't heard the good news of the gospel, to be with those who've forgotten the good news of the gospel, to be with those who are hurting, those who are hungry, those who are in trouble, to those who have lost their way. We want to be going with Christ, to follow, to follow in a way that brings glory and honor to your name, to follow in a way that shows your kingdom to the world, to follow in a way that invites people to come and see. It gives us an opportunity to invite them to come on this journey with us. Give us the courage. Give us the grace. Give us the boldness 
to go out into the world ready to take all of the opportunities you give us to invite people to know you. We ask these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, whom we are following and trying to keep up with. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.